a good life. And that's really what uh, a lot of this work is about, is we all enjoy the Toronto Islands Park. We want that to be an important uh, gem of Toronto parks, but we also want to see that as an Indigenous place where we can offer tobacco. We can offer our songs and celebrate our culture. So thank you very much, Gary. Really appreciate that. Uh, Gary, of course, is a member of and a citizen of the Mississaugas of the New Credit or Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as they're known uh, today, um, of the Michisaugig people, the original people of this territory. We're very fortunate to have uh, a very good friend of ours and, uh, and, a, and a great leader. He's uh, served on council for a long time and is now uh, the elected chief for Gima, as we say, of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, he's an artist, uh, he's a great orator, and uh, has been a, a great leader for his community. To offer us welcoming remarks uh, to the territory, I want to turn it over to the Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Chief Stacy LaForme. Hey! Oh, you're on mute, Chief. There we go. Thank you. Miigwech for that introduction and and uh, the single person who cheered. Thank you. <laughs> so Ani, Bazu, Nagani, Anishnebekinini, Stace the Forum, Disnikaz, Credit Dunjaba, Mayinga Dodum, Mississauga, Anishnabe Dao. I'd like to acknowledge the creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I'd like to acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today and welcome you to the lands of the Michisagi of the Anishinaabe. You know, I, I wanna offer you some words um, to, to remind us as we gather together. So we give thanks to the creator for allowing this gathering. We ask that he guide us and forgive us when we falter and disappoint. For though we aspire to greatness, we are after all only human. Grant us a clear mind, a pure heart and courage a clear mind to make well thought out intelligent decisions, a pure heart to make decisions that are without personal bias or desire, and the courage to use both, a clear mind and a pure heart in our lives. Let us set aside small differences. Let us not be bogged down in rhetoric. Let us live each day with a feeling of accomplishment and pride. Most importantly, let us remember we are not adversaries nor are we enemies. We share a similar past, a kindred spirit, and a common heritage. We must always remember the real reason we gather to do the right thing for our people, our children, our future. I, I'm pleased to be invited here today. I'm, I'm also pleased that this is a collaborative approach to the placekeeping work on the islands. You know, in the past, it was a place to gather, a place of peace, a place of medicine, a place of nature. And that should be reflective in whatever designs emerge. The Mississauga of the Anishinaabe are honored to play a role in the future of the islands, a place that welcomes all, a place that played a vital role in the past and hopefully will again in the future. Miigwech, be safe, Bama Pete. Uh, Chimigwech Gima, thank you so much. And a really great reminder about uh, that work that we're doing is collaborative, that uh, we can only do things uh, in partnership through collaboration. And such a great uh, message there, Chief. Uh, and uh, happy that the Mississaugas of the Credit have been uh, such good partners in, uh, in doing this placekeeping work. So it's been wonderful. I'm going to call upon uh, Councillor Mike Layton. He is the uh, He's the uh, counselor for the University of Rosedale area of uh, the city. He has been the past chair of the Aboriginal Affairs Committee. So he's a, a great ally to uh, Indigenous peoples across the city. To bring us welcoming on behalf of the city of Toronto, I'm gonna turn it over to Councillor Mike Layton. Who are you, Mike? Thank you very much, Bob, and for the warm welcome and introduction and miigwech to Chief Laforme and Gary Sue for your opening remarks and invocation. On behalf of the mayor uh, and city council, I would like to welcome everyone who's joined this event uh, the, in, this evening, including those who are joining from First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities across the city and from within your traditional territories and are, that are across Turtle Island. The residents of Toronto, the GTA, the island and users of the Toronto Island Park, as well as to our community partners. Thank you for joining us this evening, uh, your, your input uh, will be very well served, and I know that we are eager to get to that point in the discussion. 
would like to acknowledge and thank members of our interim Indigenous Placemaking Advisory Circle, who may also be in attendance this evening. This group will play an instrumental role in helping, uh, in helping the city expand placemaking and placekeeping throughout our city and through our park network. I'm honored to be part of this important event this evening, which has been designed as part of the Toronto Island master planning process. This event has the dual benefit of not only providing a series of teaching moments related to the Toronto Island master planning process, this event also serves as a demonstration of a larger commitment of the City of Toronto that we intend to follow through on our plans and commitments to continue to build partnerships with the Indigenous communities in and around Toronto, and to support the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and the calls to, for justice of the missing and murdered indigenous, indigenous women and girls. In 2018, the city established the Indigenous Affairs Office, something that we had been fighting for many years to establish. And since that time, it has been building capacity with staff in collaboration with other city divisions to develop an Indigenous framework that includes exploring opportunities for Indigenous placemaking and placekeeping throughout our parks network. There is still much more work to be done as we move through our understanding and continued commitment to truth and reconciliation with Indigenous people, but it's platforms like these that offer these initial steps. Events such as this forum are being included as part of the Toronto Island Master Plan process. They demonstrate that our actions complement our words. This is only one of the main, many city initiatives that are underway. Selena Young, the Director of the Indigenous Affairs Office, and Jamie uh, Ramoff, the General Manager of Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, will share additional details and highlights in just a few moments. But I have to say, we also spoke about the ravine system and our ravine strategy at our last Aboriginal Affairs Advisory meeting that recommended further consultation with the Indigenous community around and in Toronto for their feedback on the plans to protect uh, and, and enhance our ravine system in the city of Toronto. These ongoing conversations and partnerships with rights holders and the urban indigenous community are being expanded and will explore future opportunities for design and engagement together. These conversations will not only consider adapt, uh, adaptations of the framework as well as incremental projects or milestones that demonstrate just how successful the project uh, the collaboration uh, process and implementation of key projects can be. Um, a sincere thank you and miigwech to everyone who has contributed to the planning and coordination of this event today and to the participants. To knowledge holders and invited speakers who, are, who will provide and leave us with many insights about the importance of placemaking and placekeeping throughout the city and beyond. On behalf of the City of Toronto, I'm excited to be learning about opportunities that lie ahead, the collective understanding and relationships that it will that will strengthen uh, our path and guide us towards truth, reconciliation, reconciliation, and decolonization. Miigwech and thank you, and back to you, Bob. Thanks very much, Councillor. Really appreciate that. And uh, you know, you mentioned the ravine system, and it, it's an incredible network of parks. And if you think of the ravine system as a, as a, as a, as areas that circle. The, the core of Toronto, all along the Don Valley, all along the Humber Valley, and at the center, right to the south, is that gem of the Toronto Islands uh, Park. So it's a beautiful, it almost looks like a ring with a beautiful gem on it. Uh, and that's how I like to think of the Toronto Islands, that place we call Minasing. To give you a bit of uh, perspective and some context, to placekeeping. We're joined today by a good friend of mine. She's the director of, uh, in, of the Indigenous Affairs Office with the city. She's going to be sharing a presentation and talking a little bit about placemaking and uh, how that, uh, you know, is part of that placekeeping work that we're doing. We are making sure that that place is reflected of the Indigenous community and the efforts that we're taking to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Celine, uh, Selena Young. She is Métis uh, of the great Métis Nation. She's a wonderful uh, um, leader. She's also a speaker of the Machif language. And I'm going to turn it right back to you, Selena. So over to you. Merci, Bob. Merci. Tansi, oh. um, bonsoir. Hello. Good evening. Uh, merci. And an Eskimo, 
Elder Sue, um, Gary, it's wonderful to hear your words and your song. Thank you for, for starting us in a good way. And Chief of Forum, always wonderful to be in circle with you. I wish we were all together uh, face to face, uh, but uh, the world, uh, Mother Earth, has other plans for us. So, so we're here virtually. And, and I thank all of you, it, um, hundreds of participants. This is incredible. Uh, so uh, uh, as Bob said, Dishna Kishon Selina, I'm Métis uh, from the Prairies, uh, from Saskatchewan, but I've been welcomed into Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory for over 40 years in and around Toronto. I'm also the director of the Indigenous Affairs Office in, at the City of Toronto and, and privileged and, and honored to be here with you. I've been a public servant for 25 years, so of course I have a presentation to share with you. So I'm just gonna share uh, my screen. Give me one moment. All right, hopefully you can all see that. Bob, I'm gonna trust that you'll tell me if there's a problem. Looks good, Selena. Fabulous, thank you. So I just wanna share a little bit about the Indigenous Affairs Office and some of our thinking around placemaking. And I do also, I, I wanna just spend a moment on this word placemaking. I actually look at it in a lot of different ways. I think of placekeeping, placemaking, place revealing, place remembering, and place respecting. So um, the Indigenous Affairs Office, as, as you heard, I think it was Councillor Layton, thank you for, for mentioning, um, after an incredible amount of advocacy work in the City of Toronto, the Indigenous Affairs Office uh, was created. I started in 2018 and, and uh, we've been working um, since then. Uh, it may not be visible uh, to many folks. However, there are upwards of 100,000 First Nations, Métis and Inuit living in Toronto. Plus we have very important relationships with treaty partners like the Mississaugas of the Credit. So for all these reasons and more, having a, a standalone office in, in the country's largest city is, is incredibly important. The Indigenous Affairs Office was created so the city is better able to work with and support Indigenous rights, uh, respect the needs, and uh, work with and for Indigenous peoples in and around the city. Our role in the office is really twofold, at least this is how I describe it. It's uh, internal and external. So we could probably spend all of our time working internally with the 35,000 staff and mayor and council, uh, supporting the, the policies and programs and work. Uh, great work, like our colleagues in, in parks, forestry, and, and recreation. We also, uh, though, um, a huge part of our work is external and working directly with community, with Indigenous organizations, uh, Indigenous nations and communities in and around Toronto. So really, uh, everything we do in the office is driven by and for community. We are Indigenous community members uh, trying to make change in, uh, in a very large organization that is the City of Toronto. So when you, if you hear me saying Indigenous place making, place keeping, um, what do we mean? So, so really, it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, which is, is wonderful. And that's why we have forums like this to talk about it, right? Um, but from my perspective, at least what grounds me is it's really about access to land and water um, for Indigenous folks. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis to honor our rights and respect our rights. It's about improving the visibility of Indigenous people, historically and, and currently vibrant, incredible cultures exist in and around Toronto. We need to do a lot of work around decolonizing and indigenizing public spaces, parks being part of that. Uh, that's also a huge part of Indigenous placekeeping or placemaking. We want to explore ways to better share space and better tell the truths of the land and water in and around Toronto. So in, there's a lot of work that the Indigenous Affairs Office is involved in. Um, place keeping, place making is, is a huge amount of, of that work. So what are we trying to achieve? Why, why are we doing it? Uh, 
there are many outcomes that are supported by Indigenous placemaking and placekeeping, and, and uh, I think the pandemic has shone a light on how significant those are. It's, a, it's about Indigenous rights and self-determination, um, economic development, tourism, shelter, community gathering. Some Indigenous placemaking initiatives save lives, and others make the city safer and more inclusive. Some initiatives are really large and strategic. Probably the Toronto Island falls into that because of the significance of the island to so many. Some of these initiatives involve multiple Indigenous organizations and nations, communities, um, as well as community members and city divisions. So we do have loosely at the City of Toronto um, an Indigenous place making uh, framework. It's based on work that's been done over the last number of years, and uh, we're going to test it again with community. That's really important. Again, you know, the work that we do in the office and with the city needs to be driven by and for community. So there's four broad goals in the current existing framework uh, related to ensuring presentation and commemoration of Indigenous histories and culture. We, we, we are here. <laughs> we have not disappeared. Uh, we are alive and well, and we need to tell the stories. We need to tell our stories. It's about creating space. And it's not just physical space. It's about space and process and policy for ceremony, teaching, and community. It's about strengthening connections with land and waters, both traditionally and temporarily, contemporarily. And building capacity for land-based Indigenous engagement and programming, uh, and in many ways, in greater cultural competency for non-Indigenous folks in Toronto to better understand the significance of land and water for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So what is next? Uh, currently, we have an interim Indigenous placemaking advisory circle uh, that's helping us advise on a selection process and the governance of a, a more permanent circle. The circle's purpose is really to guide and advise Indigenous placemaking initiatives and work with the city to, to develop the strategy. So we might have this framework. Is it, is it right? What else do we need to do? What does it look like across the land and waters of Toronto. Uh, so we're going to work on a strategy. Um, we really want to be intentional. I think um, lots of amazing placemaking initiatives have happened um, over years in Toronto, and and a lot of them, to be uh, to be fair, have been driven by Indigenous people. A lot of the initiatives are grassroots. And the city has reacted and tried to support wherever they can, but we want to be more intentional. We want to be more proactive and supportive in, in whatever that looks like for community. So that's part of the work that's underway and the circle will advise that. The circle is uh, ultimately going to be composed of Indigenous artists, designers, land stewards, um, earth workers, historians, uh, knowledge carriers and seekers, language holders, youth, two-spirited folks, as, as well as elders. Uh -huh. And uh, a couple of the other things that we, we have on the go are listed on the slide, starting to think about what is existing and, and uh, lay that out um, visually through a digital mapping exercise. We need to better coordinate internally. Again, very large labyrinth that is the city of Toronto, so better coordination. And the Indigenous-led development of, as, as, as I was saying, the proactive and comprehensive placemaking strategy. And I will leave you there. Um, merci for your time, for, for, for coming tonight, um, taking up your evening. This is incredibly important work. Hearing from community is what matters. It should be what drives us and how, how we make decisions. And so we've got a, a wonderful, I'm just amazed by the, the group of folks that are present and, and will speak. And, and for all of those uh, in community ha who have joined, I'm just so grateful for your time. And uh, Bob, over, over to you. All right. Merci. Marci Miigwech. Thank you very much. Yahweh, Selena. Wonderful presentation. I love the photos that you have in your presentation. 
Uh, we are going to go over to uh, speak a little bit more about this project. And I see some questions already there. Uh, again, uh, you're going to get a chance to ask some questions. Uh, we may answer them live, but uh, save your questions for the panelists. We are going to be having an Indigenous placekeeping panel coming up uh, very soon. So I will like to uh, uh, turn it over to Jamie Romoff. She's the general manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation for the City of Toronto. She's going to provide that introduction to placekeeping in the Toronto Islands Park, a little overview of the work that we're doing. And uh, she's going to be uh, taking us through that right now. So over to Jamie to uh, give us your presentation. Thanks, Bob, and uh, good evening, everyone. Just want to start uh, with a big thank you to Selena for providing the insights into the Indigenous Affairs Office, which is doing such great work. Uh, we're fortunate here in Parks, Forestry and Recreation to be able to support and partner with you to advance truth, reconciliation, decolonization of the City of Toronto in a meaningful way through our Parks, Forestry and Recreation work. A sincere thanks to Selena and all of the office and the uh, all of the staff in the Indigenous Affairs Office who have become our great partners uh, and supporters in the work that we're doing. And good evening to all of you. I'm always amazed when we do these uh, these uh, these digital meetings. How many people attend? I, I hear we have over 175 people on. So welcome all, and and thank you for spending your time with us this evening. Um, Today, uh, this Indigenous placekeeping forum marks the completion of phase one of the Toronto Island Park Master Plan, which is a, a very large project for, for us. Again, my name is Jamie Romoff and I am the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation with the City of Toronto. I'm so pleased to be here uh, with Chief LaForm and Elder Gary Sue and Councillor Layton, along with other knowledge holders and invited speakers. I'm very much looking forward to the panel. This evening's forum is intended to build on the momentum that has already started beginning with the Toronto Island Master Plan ceremonial project launch, which was on March 17th, and the in-depth and extensive engagement that has been completed through phase one to date. And we thank you all for your input thus far. The purpose of this evening's forum is to collectively deepen our understanding of placekeeping and the importance and significance of the Toronto Islands to the indigenous community as an important place, uh, a place for healing, ceremony and celebration. We also acknowledge the spirit of the people, the ancestors of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples who walk these lands and paddled these waters and the vibrant urban indigenous community that now calls Toronto home. We recognize that many of our parks and spaces across the city, including Toronto Island are not reflective of First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Through our collaboration with Chief LaForm, elders and knowledge keepers such as Gary, Sue, Mitch Case, uh, Diane Longboat and, and Shelley Charles who are here with us this evening, we're endeavoring very, very hard to change that. A fundamental priority of the Toronto Island Master Plan is to ensure that the Toronto Island Park is seen as a special indigenous place now and seven generations into the future. To achieve this placekeeping, we will uh, be an important approach and thread uh, uh, what is considered uh, in the vision for how the park will evolve over time. It will guide future decision-making for improvements and help to shape the development of new programs and amenities. Through the phase one engagement, we learned so much already. Uh, we've been taught that uh, indigenous placekeeping is an approach to design based on land stewardship that is centered on recognizing the rights of landscape as a living being first and considering our responsibilities to a place now and into the future. We've learned that indigenous placekeeping thinks beyond our immediate benefits and defines a relationship of reciprocity to all living things and systems and how they work together. We've also learned about the importance of ceremony and the sharing of knowledge through teaching and the importance of considering multiple generations, past, present, and future. Finally, we've learned that we must act as stewards to consider the land, the water, the flora, and the fauna of the Toronto Islands and our park spaces across the city to honor and protect these precious resources and to remember that they are not here for human benefits alone. Parks, Forestry and Recreation, we call ourselves PFNR for short, is working uh, to ensure that placekeeping and placemaking opportunities are being made a priority and are integrated into our daily work through various methods. And I should say that 
within all of the park design and planning that we do, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, that we're entering into. We're considering Indigenous design as a culturally responsive, responsive and value-based approach to park planning, design, and community development. The Toronto Island Master Plan is a great example where we have hired Indigenous design and engagement consultants to inform the work and help shape the master plan. We're also working closely with the Mississaugas of the Credit, First Nation, and other First Nations and Indigenous communities to develop a plan that will include space for tradition, culture, and ceremony in the park. We've expanded our engagement process to ensure thoughtful, authentic, and inclusive engagement, including Indigenous sharing circles, uh, which, uh, which we have for several capital projects already, including Centennial Park in St. Jamestown, with honoraria offered to participants. We've included Indigenous engagement processes to inform design outcomes within the Green Line project, Edwards Gardens, and the David Crombie Park Master Plan. Uh, as Councillor Layton uh, noted, we're now entering into some planning with the Toronto Ravine strategy. And we've also supported the Indigenous Affairs Office and the establishment of the Indigenous Placemaking Advisory Circle. All very exciting work for us. We're creating spaces in parks and ravines with opportunity for land stewardship, urban agriculture, and gathering spaces. For example, our urban forestry group uh, and our parks groups are assisting Indigenous organizations and and communities such as an AGBI to obtain land access and resources for, for a teaching lodge in the Humber River floodplain. As I said, I'm honored to be part of this Indigenous Placekeeping Forum and to help guide these important changes here in the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division at the City of Toronto. I'm committed uh, to working with everyone as we work through all of these exciting opportunities together. I'm excited to learn from the knowledge keepers and invited speakers this evening and I look forward to considering how it will help inform the Toronto Island Master Plan and also shape our parks and park processes now and into the future. Uh, Jim Gwetch, everyone, and back over to you, Bob. Jim Gwetch, Janie, thank you so much. Janie, of course, was also our, uh, our MC for the launch event that took place uh, March 17th. That's when we started this work and uh, this great uh, uh, work on the Toronto Islands Park Master Plan but also some of the Indigenous engagement work began then. And for us, we start things off in ceremony. That's such an important value for our people. And to start that off in that good way on that day was terrific. So thanks for all that joined us then. Uh, that is the beginning of our, of our event, the opening comments, uh, the opening ceremony, and of course, some of the context. We are now going to move into our elders and knowledge holders panel. One of the questions we have there is, uh, from uh, Jan from Saugin Ojibwe uh, asking, what's the program this evening? Well, you've gone through the opening ceremony and the welcoming and, uh, and the context. Now we've got two panels. This first panel is gonna be a panel of indigenous elders and knowledge holders. And uh, to provide their perspective from the spirit, from that indigenous traditional cultural context. Uh, and then we also have a panel on specific indigenous placekeeping initiatives throughout the city. So those are the two panels that we have. I encourage you to get involved. If you have a question you'd like to ask the panelists, we have four panelists on each of these panels, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, we welcome you to do that. So uh, if you just look below here uh, in the, uh, in the, the uh, control panel, you'll see the Q&A function, and then you type in your question there. Wait for the panels to, to get started though. And the other way we ask you to just to raise your hand and we are going to identify you and you'll be able to ask your question to the panelists. Please identify which panelists you want to turn your question to and then we'll ask away. So uh, the four panelists we have for this uh, first uh, panel on elders, uh, by the elders and knowledge holders, um, Gary Sue is going to go first. So Gary Sue, of course, is uh, Michisagi. Uh, he is our, our elder. He's a ceremonial leader and also a veteran of the United States Navy. So Gary is going to go first, followed by Mitch Case, who's a, a counselor for the Provisional Council of the Métis Nation of Ontario. He's also a knowledge holder as well. He is uh, Medewin Anishinaabe, Medewin Métis of the Three Fires Medewin uh, Society. 
Uh, Diane uh, Donatakwas uh, Longboat from Six Nations of the Grand River is going to be speaking third, followed by uh, uh, Mindakwe Shelley Charles from the Chippewas of Georgina Island. So lots of great knowledge to, uh, to have. So I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Gary. Gary, uh, what we're going to ask you is to provide your perspective on placekeeping, on placemaking, and what place means to you and from your perspective. And uh, then uh, we are going to have uh, Mitch uh, right after you. So over to you to start, Gary. Oh, you're on mute though, Gary. There you go. There we go. Uh, you didn't like my roar about the chief. That's why you shut, you muted me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, I, lo I look at the, like uh, the Toronto Islands uh, holds a, a special place in the uh, side of myself because uh, uh, I first run into the Islanders when we were on a protest. We were on a protest protesting uh, uh, the uh, airport on the uh, Toronto Islands uh, and we uh, met up with the uh, the Islanders, uh, they because they were protesting also, and so we sort of joined forces and marched. Uh, uh, and uh, I run into a, 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 a photographer, and he uh, he was. Uh, I found out later he he, he uh, uh, specifically went out of his way to uh, go to press. Uh, to uh, protests and different things that were happening uh, in the city of Toronto so that uh, he could uh, put it down in, uh, in pictures. So uh, he, uh, you see, he had a lot, uh, a lot of, uh, he had a, a, one of a really uh, young uh, Jimmy Dick and she had, uh, he had uh, identified all of them but one. So he asked me to put the picture out so that uh, he could uh, do that. So he really knew the Aboriginal community in a, in a, in a different uh, way than what we normally, uh, but we came, became friends. And so uh, I, uh, I, I, he said to me, he said, uh, do you know uh, 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 Catherine Longbone? And I said, "Oh yeah." I said, so "I said that that's my niece, uh, my uh, my uh, sister uh, is from uh, New Credit, but she uh, she married a uh, she married a long woman over uh, on uh, Six Nations." I said that. So uh, she's got both teachings in a in a sense, and uh, he said, "Oh," she he said because. She came to Snake Island and uh, she uh, uh, had a sweats for two weeks uh, on the island to, uh, and, uh, on a, a specific island called Snake Island. And I, 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 uh, I ended up going there that, that the place drawed uh, me to it and uh, so when we when we went to uh, uh, the chiefs of uh, Ontario were going to uh, hold a, a shaking tent ceremony and they they asked me uh, if I could find them so I took them to Snake Island. So they were doing uh, a uh, for a, a, a water there uh, so that the so that the uh, government of Ontario would understand what the Anishinaabe people uh, hearts felt towards the water. Uh, so the water declaration was uh, formed there. Uh, and uh, They passed the legislation into the shaking tent to make any changes on it so that uh, it would stand, uh, stand in court and uh, uh, look in a, in a, a good way so that uh, uh, we could bring it to light. So uh, that's what we were there for, to bring that thing to life again. And uh, so there, there was a couple of changes, but uh, uh, we uh, 
brought it uh, to light and uh, it still stands today. So uh, Snake Island always holds a, a, a better, but the rest of the island is beautiful. And uh, uh, I, uh, I understand that, but it's like, uh, they say there's going to be a, uh, uh, an artist who's going to uh, make a, a, a statue of uh, Missy Benishu, the, the great horned lynx. And uh, he's, a, he's a storm uh, maker. And I thought, gee, that's pretty appropriate because the Toronto Islands weren't islands uh, until a big storm came in the, in the, in the 18. Uh, hundreds and uh, it cut the sandbar that joined them to the to the land uh, away from there, and then the water started uh, to make it uh, deeper and deeper. So uh, it's uh, and then the Anishinaabe people said, "Oh, look at this! They're taking all our lands all over the place." Here on this place, we've got new land that it it's uh, it's for us. The creator created another place for us, so they they made it into a, a place where uh, it was close to their hearts, and uh, they their young men would go there for a vision quest. Uh, so it, it, the Toronto Islands holds. Uh, uh, I guess uh, not only the, the, the thoughts that I, I had uh, uh, when I uh, went there and uh, uh, revisited it, but uh, it brought up uh, ancestral uh, feelings inside of my heart that uh, this was a, a good place to uh, be and uh, it should be uh, more... Uh, I don't know what you want to call it that, but uh, I, the word came into my, uh, so people could understand and explore the uh, uh, Aboriginal people as well as uh, studying the island uh, and the different plants, the different things that uh, make it all up. Miigwech. I thought that, uh, we're only supposed to have eight minutes in yeah. between ourselves. So. You did terrific, Gary. Thank you so much, uh, Jimmy Witch. Uh, we're going to turn it over now to uh, my good friend, Mitch Case. Uh, Mitch Case is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario and serves as a regional councillor for the Sault Ste. Marie region of the Provisional Council of the Métis Nation of Ontario. Mitch previously served two terms as president of the Métis Nation of Ontario Youth Council. He's also a member of the Three Fires in the Daywind Lodge. And Mitch is among the most talented beater you will ever see. Talented in the Anishinaabe style, but also very talented and, uh, and one of the foremost uh, uh, artists in the Métis floral style. And uh, unfortunately, this forum isn't about beadwork. It's about uh, Indigenous placekeeping, but check out Mitch's work. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mitch Case. Over to you, Mitch. Miigwech for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, uh, for full disclosure, I did not pay Bob for that uh, <laughs> kind, kind intro. Uh, and and we're, it's very glad that we're not, uh, we're not talking about beadwork. We'd be here all for the rest of the month. But uh, uh, we talk today, Minoja Boy Nishna Ben in it now, about Ting Donja Bob, Ding the Devon in it now, Miss Wayne Don Geek Geeks to him, we need you on the day we are. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. And, and, uh, I, I'm gonna, I, I, I've, I've prepared some, some, uh, little notes here because I, uh, I'm, if I were asked to list my skills, uh, I could probably come up with some things, including beadwork, but brevity would not be one of them. So, I'm, I made some notes to make sure I stayed on topic and, and, uh, didn't end up wandering too much. But um, first, I want to acknowledge uh, Gary and, and uh, Chief Laforme and, and uh, identify with uh, some of the words that Gary shared there. Some of my best friends I met at protests too. So I, I get that. Uh, I get your words there, Gary, and, and miigwech for your, for your opening. So um, I think uh, just, just sort of uh, high level and some of the things that I've been thinking about in leading up to this, uh, 
to this panel this evening. Um, and uh, and I and I, sh I should also acknowledge my uh, Medewan auntie over there, Shelley, who I know is going to be speaking after me. And uh, but I just leading up to tonight, I, I um, I've been thinking about placekeeping and how as a uh, you know, as a Métis person uh, coming from, from this place here at the heart of the Great Lakes and, and you know, my people's uh, shared story extending from the upper Great Lakes and across Western Canada, um, you know, uh, part of our story also, though, is the, the story of displacement from our lands and displacement from, from any place to, uh, to call home. And, and there is, uh, with, the, with the very minute exception of uh, the settlements in Alberta, there is there's no place for Métis people to go back home to, right? Uh, there's uh, there is no uh, no communal land base for us, no no place uh, that we can that we can turn to, um, and that that really uh, that really affects our our uh, our way that we're able to uh, to carry on and, and continue and preserve and protect our our culture and way of life, right? And um, you know that that really um, informs my my work and my way of thinking and the the work that I'm trying to do here for for my community and. At the at the direction of my elders who've uh, uh, you know uh, trained me up uh, for for many years and and uh, you know held me responsible for uh, for for going and, and uh, you know uh, shaking an agreement out of Canada um, so that's uh, that's part of the work that I do but um, you know from from our perspective uh, from from a Métis perspective you know somewhere like uh, somewhere like Toronto is is. Uh, you know, uh, definitely outside of the Métis homeland, definitely outside of our traditional territory, and it's it's not a place that our uh, our communities have a historic tie to. Uh, but there are thousands of Métis people who live there today. There are thousands of Métis people who've been through colonialism, been displaced from our our traditional territories, whether that's uh, Drummond Island, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, the 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 you know those those places farther west in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where we know that the uh, the troops went out there and 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 resettled and and displaced our people from there and and many many people ended up particularly post World War II ended up in uh, in places like Toronto Oshawa Windsor uh, you know trying to trying to find a, a way to to make a living right and so um, you know in in terms of uh, you know building good relationships I, I you know I, I think uh, it's also important that you know I'm my formal education is as, as as a historian, right? And so that's that's the other way that I approach this. And and you know, uh, looking at the history of my community in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and and other communities that I uh, you know Métis communities across uh, you know the Upper Great Lakes in Western Canada, we uh, it, it was you know particularly business interests from Toronto and and other places that came in and removed us, right? All of our traditional lands. I'm sitting here at my house and I can see our traditional village just across the bay is where our traditional village in Sault Ste. Marie was and it was all land speculators uh, and business interests from Toronto who, who pushed us off our lands and and as a result many of our people are now living in Toronto right so so in, in as part of that legacy right uh, building a good relationship there would would certainly involve uh, the, uh, the the modern Métis community that, that live there. That again, it's not a historic community. It's not our traditional territory and, and, and we wouldn't claim it as such, but to have that good modern relationship, a place where we can go and, and you know, uh, see ourselves identified, see our stories represented uh, and to, uh, to practice our culture. Just sort of in, in wrapping up, I think there's a few places that I would uh, recommend, uh, you know, anybody who's on the, uh, on the the zoom tonight um geez we've been on this thing for like every day for a year and i forgot the name of it but uh we um for everyone who's on the zoom tonight there's some some really uh key examples i think of the metis nation being involved in in placekeeping uh there is um there's work here that uh this is the the shameless uh plug for my own community but there's work that my community is doing here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, reclaiming lands right downtown Sault Ste. Marie, where, where where our traditional village was, and where there is uh, there are graves of our ancestors that for over a century have been uh, uh, sort of uh, ignored, uh, and we've we've reclaimed that land, and and we're we're in the process of uh, uh, establishing uh, the first of its kind uh, cultural center and and museum in that in that place in the the former church that was built on our on our cemetery. Uh, so there's that work happening. There's work that my community's uh, working on with uh, 
uh, sort of be very beginning the stages uh, of discussions with Ontario Parks around the uh, the Agua Bay Village, where our our village was was burned out in 1967 to make way for uh, uh, to make the park uh, somewhere nice for uh, for tourists from southern Ontario to go and enjoy. Um, and so we're doing that work. There's of course the work being done by our relatives in Saskatchewan around Batosh and the National Historic Site and the Batosh. Uh, uh, festival grounds where they're they've done that work uh, with with on with uh, Parks Canada to uh, recognize the Métis Nation's jurisdiction over that that most sacred place for us that place where uh, where you know where where our, our our leader was captured and where our uh, our people shed blood to protect our lands um, and then of course there's Métis Crossing that our relatives in Alberta are leading Métis Crossing is a as a wonderful place uh, that they're they're really uh, working to develop to protect their story out there. So that's that's very high level. And, and Bob knows how uh, how incredibly difficult it is for me to uh, to uh, you know speak for anything less than an hour. But uh, I I do appreciate that. And you know if there's questions, I, I will I, I'll, I'm I'm here for that. And uh, I uh, I'll I'll turn it back over to Bob. And I I hope I was uh, concise but still intelligible. So. Oh, merci, up Jimmy Gwich, uh, Mitch, uh, my relative there in a place called Bao Ting, uh, that uh, traditional is one of our key stopping places in our uh, Anishinaabe Greek migration story. So happy that you're out there in, uh, in 1850 Treaty Territory, Mitch. Uh, the next uh, speaker I'd like to introduce is Godatakwas, uh, Diane Longboat. She's Turtle Clan from uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. She's a Mohawk woman. Uh, she's uh, worked with me as the co-chair of the Indigenous Peoples Program of the Parliament of the World Religions back in 2018. We did some amazing work there in creating that Lodge of Nations, that very beautiful space for our own people, our teachers, our elders, our knowledge keepers. Um, she's a dedicated elder and advisor to Cam H and is dedicated to that wellness, that wellness journey of our people. She's also the founder of Soul of the Mother, an initiative that speaks to healing, that speaks to the healing of the earth. And uh, she's gonna be talking to us about the importance of that space and how it relates to the land, relates to ceremony and relates to wellness. So please welcome Diane Longboat. Yawa, thank you so much, Bob. I'm so grateful to be with you this evening and I send warm and loving greetings out to each and every one of you, to your families. So much gratitude to Elder Gary Sue and to Gima Laform for opening us up and, and situating us on the land. I, I want to just say how special those islands are to me personally. And in doing a little bit of research, uh, finding out that that uh, beautiful peninsula that uh, Gary referred to, that sandbar that joined the mainland to the island, was such an important place on the islands for our people that we did so much trading at the St. Lawrence market area. And then uh, people typically did not stay on the mainland. When the trading was done, they would head over to the island because those islands contained spiritual vortexes where healing was deep and it was profound. And when people had a chance to come and spend time and trade, in those summer uh, times of gatherings, they would always go to the island for those spiritual vortexes of healing. So I want to raise up that land and I want to say, you know, how important it is for all of us to understand Indigenous wisdom traditions, Indigenous knowledge systems, because all of our teachings are tied to source. The source for us is the creator, the sky world, the spiritual beings, the ancestors, the living spirit within Mother Earth. Those are what we call first law. First law is for all of humanity and for all of the living beings within creation. First law cannot be contravened. And, you know, we're seeing the outcome of that today when human beings essentially make their own laws and do it for personal ego, um, personal gratification, personal accumulation of wealth or status. What happens is that when we move out of first law, we move into human law made law, we lose that original relationship that we have with the earth. That's where indigenous wisdom traditions 
impact what you're doing today at the islands. They set a law in place, they set behaviors and ethics in place, and they set a way of protocol that we have with one another and with the land. It sets it all in place. So our, our contributions are immense when it comes to talking about the land. We also understand that the code of life is written on the land, that all of our ceremonies, our languages, our teachings talk about giving thanks and gratitude, love and respect to every part of creation, from the waters, the soils, the plant life, the animal life, the living beings that are in the waters, the, the living beings that are flyers. So all those elements of life form a, con a, a, a great council of creation. And when they form that council of creation, all of our songs, our dances, our ceremonies, our prayers, our words of gratitude and love go out to all those beings in creation and embolden them and energize them. They are sentient beings. Mother Earth is a sentient being. And we have a language of spirit that we learn, whether it's in the Longhouse, whether it's in the Madewan Lodge, whether it's in, you know, the, the sun dances of our people, you know, all of those ceremonies point to the opportunity to learn that language of spirit, to communicate with the trees, the water, the winds, the animal life, the medicines. And so that is our journey as, as Ongwe Hongwe people. We also share that journey with others. And I'm hoping that these Toronto islands can be a place of learning for all people to fall in love with creation. And I remember in 1994, when I left my job at the University of Toronto building First Nations House at U of T, I moved home to my community and it was such a, a beautiful, beautiful move. The chiefs, the clan mothers and the faith keepers surprised us with a wonderful party. And uh, we spent the whole day together. And at the very end, you know, they gave us gifts and they said how grateful they were that we had come home. And they said those words that everybody wants to hear, welcome home. And I think, you know, when, when our people go to those Toronto islands, that's what we want to feel, welcome home. Welcome home to these spiritual vortexes. Welcome home to this magnificent water that is here, all the medicines that are there in that beautiful park area. So we are, we are now at a point of mutual respect and collaboration with the city of Toronto that I think, you know, we only dreamed about 10 years ago. Like this is, this is a momentous opportunity for us as Ongwe people to have a voice and a place in the design of these places. And so what I want to share with you is the importance of that land and the importance of developing, and I guess throw out a challenge to you, the importance of developing a law that's gonna protect that land because the importance of that land is this, that not only are there sacred places over there, spiritual vortexes of healing, but when you dig into that soil, there's going to be sacred items that are there. We need to be able to have a law that's gonna support and protect our sacred places and repatriate sacred items that need to come home to our people. Canada does not have a law. The United States does, but Canada does not. So. I want to throw that challenge out and I and I want you to think about that because we are in a time and a place now where we need to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder. And that means that we need to support one another in this care of the land. And as we do that, what we're doing is we're showing the creator that we are actually living by that first law, which is to take care of one another and to take care of the land. So thank you so much for inviting me here tonight and, and thank you to, to the panelists who are here, to Mitch and to Gary and to my sister Shelly. It's such an honor to be with you tonight and, and, and to Bob, thank you for leading us this evening. Miigwech. 
Thank you so much for your beautiful words. And that, that reminder that the Toronto Islands and the work that we're doing, it is about home. That's what placekeeping is, that it's always been a home for us, that we want that to continue to be our home in the future. And I think as Chief LaForme said to us earlier, it's not just our home, it's a home that we're going to share. And that's why those treaties were made. The treaties weren't a sale of land or a surrender of land. They were about sharing, sharing it among nations. I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to my sister, uh, my sister in, uh, in spirit. Uh, her name is Mendokwe. She's of the Mishkinojik uh, clan uh, of uh, Chippewas of Georgina Island. Uh, she's a Anishinaabe elder. She holds a Master's of Indigenous Philosophy from Seven Generations Institute has a background in horticulture science, and she was the first Dean of Indigenous Education and Engagement at Humber College and uh, you know, won an award of excellence in Indigenous Education by the Colleges and Institutes Canada in 2015. Sheldy learned a lot of what she's uh, come to know in horticulture from her grandmother, who is from Nea Shingaming in uh, Saugeen Ojibwe territory. Uh, Shelly has uh, worked a lot with Indigenous people. Um, she's uh, working with Indigenous women through an agriculture project with the Native Women's Association of Canada. She's an instructor and advisor for First Nations Technical Institute in Tayendanega. Uh, she's, she's working with the York Region District School Board. And she's the founder of Minokamik. Uh, an emerging Indigenous design services collective that's doing Indigenous placekeeping right here in the city. So without further ado, over to Shelley Charles. Shelley. Bonjour. There you go. Oh, bonjour, Bob. Chimi uh, Gwerch for that, um, that introduction as well. Um, your uh, Sema arrived, the sacred uh, Sema arrived in the mail, arrived today. So I'm, I'm going to be holding um, her uh, as, I, as I present today. Um, bonjour, bonjour, Michel Misunanik, Koka Misunanik, Mandao, Kwendish Nikaz, Maskanoje, and Dodem. A Jonyang, Jonyang in Donjaba, meanwhile. Meanwhile, Nayashi, Nayashi, and Nigaming, and Gaye no Chamo warning. Mishomusanic, Gokumisanic, Natam Gijika, Gagwajimigo, Gagwajimigo, on Adama this, on Adamashin. Gagigay, Gagigay, Nishnabe, Que, Nisome de Wind, Que, Ajawena Mission, Joena Mission on. With those first words that I, I sent up, uh, I sent up in the language. Um, I'm going to put this timer on here. Uh, in the language, my first language, which is um, Ojibwe. I am from um, um, the Williams Treaty Territory right here. I'm at Lake Simcoe now. Uh, and also we call um, Lake Simcoe Joniang, uh, and it is really the way the water, um, the way the water uh, sparkles. And I'm Fish Clan. Uh, my family is the, the one of the original families of the region. Uh, Georgian Island is the closest uh, First Nation community to Toronto. And my um, family was the original family, but now we are um, the last uh, Muskinoja, Muskinoja clan family. And um, when you're going north on, on Woodbine, once you cross over, you get closer to Georgina, you cross over the Muskinoja River, and that's when I know um, that I'm um, that I'm almost home. So, um, so thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here today um, with, with all of these amazing people. Gachimi uh, Gwech Gary for that uh, awesome opening uh, opening song um, as well. As Bob uh, shared with you, I'm working with a collective, uh, Minokamik. Minokamik uh, is uh, good earth, and we called it, uh, it's Minokamik. Um, it's a collective of good earth people and stewards and specialists uh, on the land 
uh, erosion specialists, horticulturalists, uh, elders, historians as well. In doing this um, restoration of the old marshland um, on the lakefront, um, at the lakefront, with other partners, uh, we're working with Waterfront um, Toronto and also um, the uh, Michael Van Valkenburg Associates, the Mississaugas of the Credit, working directly with Mark LaForm and Kathy Jameson. And also um, in, in that way of working, um, we developed a community engagement process uh, based on original um, EAs and we um, consulted with all of the communities uh, in the GTA in an effort to um, uh, be, to, to develop an inclusive approach uh, to the restoration of the land there, the marshland there uh, on the shore, on the lakefront, um, but also an inclusive approach to acknowledge um, the traditional names and um, the traditional territory. Diane talked about, um, she talked about how important names are. And I was really glad that she referenced that because I've, um, I've always been taught by um, my, my family that the language um, is written on the land. So wherever we walk, we can name those plants in the territory and the, the, the way the land um, is emerging from, from every tall tree to the tiniest asinis. So when I... Um, when we started this work, we started back in July 24th uh, last year during the pandemic. And like Bob had said, one of the most important things uh, for me as a Medewan, also as a Nishnabe Kwe, was to go and um, do ceremony on the land to uh, introduce ourselves to that land and also um, to let, um, let the land know what it was, uh, what our intentions were, what our intentions were in restoring um, indigenous plants and, and bringing all those voices and dialogue together in a really, really good way. And, and, we, and I felt that was really important because that particular land there is where the mouth of the Don River has been um, closed um, since 1918. So there's going to be this huge restoration of parkland, um, indigenous designs, placemaking uh, plants and art. So it's, it's a pretty exciting uh, project um, to be involved with. When I think of placemaking, I'm reminded of a couple of projects that I've worked on in the past, the um, Humber River Arboretum uh, Medicine Gardens, uh, also uh, the McMichael Gallery in Kleinberg and um, Humber College's North and Lakeshore campuses and how um, the bringing together of, his, of elders um, and youth, indigenous um, youth leadership was really um, important and integral to once again, it's an inclusive approach of nations, but it's also a inter, what I call an intergenerational approach of um, coming together and bringing that knowledge together from the past um, into the present. And then how are we gonna move that in into the future? How are we gonna um, move that to that place of Nigan in Abe? So speaking of Nigan and Abe, one of the um, one of the really important things when I think of Minising, um, it I have a story about fasting at Minising, but I'll share it another time. When I think of if I was standing on um, the four directions, Waban Jalman, Ningabianong, Minwagi, Wedenong, from wherever I'm standing and looking outwards, I can um, I can see and know and think about where our, our other um, communities are. Most of our communities are right next to, alongside or within bodies of water. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking really specifically about how menacing is related to our communities from whatever direction you look. So if you think of um, Nigani, Nigani Gichikime, that's that leading that leading lake or or Wabishkigo, 
Whitewater Lake. Um, if you go looking towards um, Majidashk, Majidashk is where that uh, um, meets, uh, meets Georgian Bay, flows into Georgian Bay. And also if you were standing there in Minasing, you could look towards um, Junyong. And then you could, and then on another spot of the island, you could be, you would be looking at uh, Gine, G Gabe, Gabe Ganang. I'm trying to talk too fast. Gabe Ganang, which is the um, the um, end of the trail. So our Anishinaabe trails, um, it isn't just the carrying place trail, but that trail actually starts up in the north, and it starts um, in the Great Lakes and comes through. Um, our no um, uh Bruce Peninsula, Neashing territory, and then it ends, it comes down through the marsh, carrying place trail, and then it ends there, Gabeganang, and that's also known as um, the end of the trail, but it's also referring um, to the Humber River. Oh. It's really, um, when I think about inclusion, and I think I'm really trying to acknowledge the water and how important this water is life and how can we educate people on ge geographical um, spaces, where we're standing, where we're walking, where our, we're, walk we're walking in the moccasin tracks of those that came before us. So I'll end with, um, um, I think I got a minute and 30 seconds because I was timing you all. <laughs> um, the other thing that occurred to me that would be really critical in moving forward in this notion of place, uh, place making and understanding that the language um, is written on the land is also to acknowledge our chiefs of the past, to acknowledge um, the leadership that was traveling along um, 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 along these rivers and, and lakes, including Wabanose, uh, Maskinoja, Gichimakwa, Genebako, Inene. Gary was talking about Snake Island and those um, people that are related to, to Genebako and Inene are part of the Awasis uh, clan. So I think of the leadership and then also uh, in moving forward, the, the larger picture is to acknowledge our clans, our dotems, and how they're related. So one of them is a Megizye, like our like uh, my brother, and Fish Clan, Amic Clan, um, Nigig, Bear Clan. And when you put that all together, you're creating this extended relationship of the land, the namings of the plants, the waters, who walked before us, and then um, what work did they do? And what territories, where did those clans go to? Where are they now? So if you're standing in Minnesota, you could look around in any direction and you'd have a really good idea of where your relatives were over, over in the East and where those special sacred places are um, as well. So uh, I um, think that um, I'm right on time. Gitchimi <laughs> Gwetsch. Shelley, thank you so much. I've got a couple of questions already teed up. I'm going to go to Wendy uh, in the uh, in the participants box in a second. But uh, two questions before we get to Wendy. Number one, I'm going to give this one to Diane. And the question for Diane is, uh, you know, our definition or our 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 philosophy around placekeeping is keeping in mind the rights of the land, the water the plants and the animals, that creation has rights. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you again, very shortly, well, I'll ask all the panelists to keep your answers very short, one or two sentences would be great. So that way we get to more questions. But Diane, how do you feel the rights of creation should fit into indigenous placekeeping work? I think, um, I think we need to develop an ethical charter and that ethical charter may be the forerunner for a law that actually has protection of the land embedded in it. That, those ethical charters, when you look at the Anishinaabe tradition, Madewin, the Longhouse tradition, um, the Ongwehongwe tradition, 
all those ethics are embedded in all of our teachings. And so we need to combine those ethics, make an ethical charter and, and have it eventually made into law. Miigwech, Diane. I've got a question for you, Shelley, although Jan Pugsley uh, originally had it for Diane, but it's probably most appropriate for Shelley. They're asking uh, about a specific place, Shelley. Can you tell us more about Noj Moane, that uh, sacred, beautiful place that's over in Neashingami? So tell us a little bit of Noj Moane, very shortly again. Um, Noj Moane is um, where I was raised. So I was raised um, with my um, grandparents here, but then um, we moved to my grandmother's community, uh, which is Nea Shingaming, and which is where I fasted and on all of my children fasted and my grandson as well. It's um, talking about, um, there's, a, there's a place where we call um, that water and um, it's um, um, Giji Bai Ashe one. And it's that um, there's a number of places like that in our communities. And that's a place where we would go to have um, ceremonies um, and go to fast um, with those, uh, with our relatives, um, with our relatives. Miigwech, Shelley. Wendy Gale, uh, if you, uh, thanks for your patience, Wendy. If you can unmute yourself, let us know who you'd like to direct your question to. And again, if you can keep your question succinct, one basic question is really uh, helpful. So over to Wendy. Wendy, are you there? I am here, but I didn't ask a question yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got sorry. your hand. I see your hand up there, Wendy. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry, not yet. I'm just really enjoying this. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You're muted, Bob. Thanks. I got a question in the anonymous box here in the Q&A box, and this one's going to Gary. So Gary, and just in a short uh, statement, what's the role of Indigenous languages, Nishnabemwin, uh, in Indigenous placemaking? It's like, uh, it ties you to, to, uh, to the land, you know, like even the stars and uh, everything is connected. So if you're looking at, uh, Kiwait Nanong, that's a, like the North Star. That, that means uh, the going home star because we live to the North and every place when we went, we, we left. So that star would guide us to where we were uh, going to be. Uh, uh, and uh, once we got near spots where uh, uh, that were there, like, uh, uh, the place where the uh, where the eagles nest, mm. or uh, uh, like uh, a tobacco, like the, the, that's that place where the the elderberries are. So each place uh, ties the place to uh, something that uh, awakens uh, ancestral uh, memories inside of you, and you start to. Uh, Look around and say, I've never been here, but it certainly feels like it's a good place to yeah. sit around and just get used to what was there. So it's becoming more and more like uh, you haven't got that uh, feeling because it's been so eradicated. Mm. They, uh, they, they cut up all of the uh, soil, they, uh, the places and the trees that were there before that would have uh, helped to remind you are gone. Yeah. So, so it's, it's still nice to know what the, the words uh, tie you to, uh, like, uh, uh, tie you to a, a place because you know that that's, that's, that's why those deer are so along. Like we got a place in Stony Creek and it, it's called, uh, 
the, the it's a salt lick. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, some people say uh, it's it, it's it's the place where where they lick. That's because that's where the deer would go to to lick the uh, the salt, and uh, right. so they would all be around there, so that they were easy to to hunt. So different words like that tie you to the land because you realize that at one time this place had a, a meaning uh, to the Aboriginal people. Why was because uh, we were tied to everything that's around us. Thank you much, Gary. I'm gonna ask a question of Mitch. We got a question here, Mitch, uh, and it's appropriate to you. How do we engage young people? in the ideas of Indigenous uh, placekeeping? How can we uh, engage and interest young people in, uh, in that conversation? Well, that's a fantastic question. I, 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 uh, I aged out of being young uh, <laughs> nine months ago, so, uh, so, so I don't know anymore. No, I'm just kidding. I think uh, creating, uh, you know, I think young people, particularly in our, in our communities, in our Indigenous communities uh, are, are incredibly engaged in in wanting to talk about the future right wanting to talk about creating a sustainable future creating a, a positive forward forward looking my, my nobody wants to talk to me until i'm on a zoom and then my phone won't stop um but uh you know there, young people are really wanting to be engaged in a forward thinking uh future driven conversation that that talks about our um uh, you know our relationships with the earth, our relationships with our our non-human relatives, and with each other as indigenous nations, right? And with uh, with each other as indigenous peoples. And I know, you know, the the particularly the young Métis people in Toronto are are really interested about how they, as young young indigenous people from another nation, from another territory, can have good relationships with uh, with the people whose territory that is, right? And so I think um, the you know I, I don't I don't know how helpful it is but I think the advice is that that create as many opportunities for authentic conversation and and meaningful conversation and uh and then you know from that conversation you know if you if you make commitments follow through right follow through that's my that's my advice to to you know proponents and the city and and whoever else is you got to follow through then, right? Yeah, we've been, uh, we've had a lot of promises made to us as Indigenous people, and uh, you know we're we're not uh, we're not interested in any uh, any more uh, going nowhere promises, right? So uh, that's my advice, Bob. Miigwech, Mitch, and uh, you know the work that we're doing on the Toronto Islands Master Plan, especially with Indigenous people, uh, the youth are a key part of our engagement, and uh, we did host an Indigenous engagement uh, youth, uh, youth uh, engagement focus group on the advice of. Of uh, an Egbi, the Ashkenijik Nodwachigamik uh, Youth uh, Agency in the city. So that was a really great conversation from uh, great energetic young people. Okay, question is now going to go over to uh, Shelly, and this is right up your alley, Shelly. What are the role of plants in Indigenous placekeeping? And very short, Shelly, and we don't have a lot of time. So, what are the role of plants? You know, my background is horticulture, so I'll keep it really short. Um, plants, um, um, I'm going to relate it back to what Gary was talking about, adobe oak. Adobe oak we know as um, the, the um, place of the alders. And for Anishinaabe people was really talking about, which I found, and this was a teaching from my father, uh, most of these uh, teachings in, in my experience come directly from my family. And he was saying that adobe oak was if you were at um, um, on Minasing, you could actually see that that uh, the adobe oak that looks like the the trees are growing on the water. And and um, I forgot what the question was, but the there's role of, the role of uh, plants in placekeeping. Oh, so there's a lot of healing and the restoration of the land, uh, the soil, uh, the environment. And we, when we think of adobe oak, I, had, I developed a, a, really, a really close relationship with that plant through um, a really good friend of mine, uh, Lynn Short. And Lynn Short is an environmental uh, species at risk um, uh, steward specialist. 
And one of the things that I found when we were walking the length of the Humber Arboretum, I asked her about this plant and she said to me, all of these ones here are the European cultivars and they're actually um, um, taking all the available water from the indigenous species. So when we removed and started to thin out the European varieties of the adobe oak and replaced them, with the North American species, what we saw was this huge proliferation of wildflowers that had never been there, that they were like extinct. And, and part of that teaching is that those, um, um, for me, part of that teaching is that those seeds were always there in the soil. Mm -hmm. They were just waiting for that environment. They were waiting for the ceremony, the, the ceremony of the water, the soil, the planting, and then they just bloomed. So there's a lot of healing, um, not just for the individual, but for the land uh, itself. Thank you so much, uh, Mendakwe. And thank you everyone in this, uh, this first panel, Chimigwech, Elder Gary, Garatakwes, uh, Nyawe, uh, Marcy, Mitch, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful to hear from each and every one of you. And thank you for the great questions. Uh, I know we're, we're trying to get to as many questions as we can. But uh, we do want to make sure we make uh, some room for our second panel, which is going to be great. It's going to have a lot of good information about specific Indigenous placekeeping initiatives. So give a big round of applause wherever you are. Shout out your voice out to creation and thank our panelists, our elders and knowledge holders. Hey, miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you so much. We are now going to, um, to bring upon our uh, specific uh, panelists that are going to talk about their, their initiatives that are going to be a part of, uh, of our panel and our, our, our forum tonight. And I have to tell you that this is an incredible time to be a part of city planning, to see how place is becoming uh, more an Indigenous priority, an Indigenous conversation. And you know, we know that place is important for us as Anishinaabe, Mashkegua, Haudenosaunee, Wendat people. We know Métis people, that place is so important. It's so wonderful that the different proponents across the city, the city of Toronto, parks, forestry, and recreation are seeing that as a priority and asking Indigenous people to take a place, a truly meaningful place in developing this, uh, their spaces. So the first, uh, we've got four panelists. I'm going to just do a quick overview. Carolyn King, my great friend from Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, past chief and uh, a wonderful, she's been, uh, uh, she sits on the board of, uh, of uh, the radio station there in Oshwigan, done a lot of really amazing things. Uh, she's a member of the Order of Canada. Uh, she's going to be speaking about the moccasin identifier first. Uh, a wonderful artist, KJ Jules McCusker, is going to be speaking about his installment of public art that's going to be coming to Snake Island, and it's called Mishapiju Witu, uh, and he's going to be speaking about that. Uh, Andrea Chris John, who is the board designate from uh, Council Fire Native Cultural Center, is going to be speaking about her work to remember the legacy of residential school survivors. That's the basis of her work that she's doing and what her group is doing with regard to the Spirit Garden installation at, uh, at Nathan Phillips Square. And finally, our own Terence Radford, who is part of our Indigenous design team, who's, who is uh, advising on the Indigenous um, work uh, with the Toronto Islands Master Plan is going to be speaking for. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Carolyn. And Carolyn uh, is going to provide us a presentation. And uh, Carolyn is also uh, joined with us today by uh, her helper, Susan Robertson, who's uh, gonna run a presentation. So uh, Carolyn, as I mentioned, is the past uh, chief of, of uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, she's done a lot of amazing work in, uh, she's run the powwow, the Three Fires Homecoming powwow at Mississaugas of the Credit. For so many years, I was little, I guess, when I first went to the powwow there, but I got to know, uh, um, uh, Carolyn and her family through that time. And of course, she is a very uh, wonderful, uh, outspoken advocate about how we have put our feet and put our footprints on this place. 
So to turn it over to talk about the Moxon identifier, I'll turn it over to my friend, Carolyn King. Carolyn, are you there? Carolyn, can you hear us? Maybe I'll turn it over to Susan and until Carolyn has, uh, has got uh, herself set up. Hi, Bob, thanks. Um, I know Carolyn was having some technical issues with her computer earlier today. Um, so she might jump off and then come back on. Um, but I'm happy to, to step in for her in the spirit of time. So this presentation is called um, The Moccasin Identifier and it's about Indigenous cultural heritage, treaties to th truth and relationship to land. Just bear with me. So um, this first slide is something that Carolyn all um, really conveys very well, very well as it relates to the origin of her idea for the moccasin identifier. Um, as you can see in the slide, we're trying to encapsulate really the beginning of the moccasin identifier. And this, this first image with all the beautiful colors that shows the many First Nations in Canada um, and in the United States, Gives an, it comes from nativeland.ca. And um, beside it over here, you can see um, Champlain's maps and the maps of the early colonial settlers that came. And then down below nativeland.ca, you can see archeologists walking the field. And then beside that, the subdivision process. And, and what this image is trying to encapsulate is um, the importance of preserving Indigenous history through stages of growth, development, and land use change, and the role that they have really had in colonization and continue to have. Um, and Carolyn's famous line is, if as First Nations people, we don't get a marker on the ground today, we'll be lost forever. And we have that as part of our core messaging for the Moccasin Identifier Program. And it speaks to that process of, um, you know, colonization and erasure uh, through land use change. And my favorite slide in the presentation is Nani Benoque. Um, it was actually through her property, uh, the archaeological investigation of her property, that Carolyn was inspired to create the moccasin identifier. She was a pre-Confederation Mississauga of the Credit um, Indigenous, tireless Indigenous rights advocate. She went over eight months pregnant to meet Queen Victoria. And I'd like to share that she shook her hand. She didn't kiss her ring. So <laughs> um, she's an incredible woman who, um, it was the uh, investigation of her homestead uh, near Aurelia. I believe that our archaeologists said to Carolyn, if we don't get a marker on the ground, how will anyone know about this important woman? And, um, you know, how will, how will anyone ever know that your people were here? And, um, and Carolyn often says, it shouldn't have taken me three days, but after the third day it came to me, it was our footwear. Um, and that really began the journey of the moccasin identifier. Um, and it's, it's been 10 years, um, a decade long journey of Carolyn's tireless advocacy um, from the grassroots to, to uh, create a tool to understand the truth. And um, it's really educational content that has been developed that tries to promote knowledge and awareness to Indigenous history and worldviews in schools and public places. And we often talk about um, Murray Sinclair's quote that it's education that got us into this mess and it's education that will get us out of it. So I'm quoting Carolyn the whole way here through Bob, um, but Carolyn says we have to, we're, she wants to change our world one moccasin at a time. And when you want to change the world, it takes a lot of people and we're starting over with the children. So 
the vision of the moccasin identifier is to cover Canada and moccasins. And the mission is to advance treaty and Indigenous awareness through education, public awareness, and a network of knowledge for the benefit of truth and reconciliation. We have strategic objectives to facilitate a cultural shift um, in Canada by um, sharing treaty history with children through the educational, through the distribution of an accessible, uh, pardon, uh, accessible, accessible educational kit, which is available online at our website for free, to develop a coordinated branding program to mark significant Indigenous sites for the benefit of public awareness, to form partnerships with communities and organizations, to build understanding, engagement, and support, and to create, again, that network of knowledge on treaties to restore harmony between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, here, this slide shows the linguistic diversity of uh, Ontario, Indigenous linguistic diversity. Uh, we have Cree in the North and Anishinaabe throughout Ontario, the Huron-Wendat in Mid-Ontario, and then the Seneca around the lakes. Carolyn, there. Carolyn's here. Hey. Oh my God. I've been having trouble with my computer. Just when I took the, the mouse, it just went zoom out. <laughs> well, you, oh, got a couple, you got a couple more minutes, Carolyn. Okay. All right. So Susan, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking over like that. Oh, my goodness. Um, Chimi wish to all the uh, people who have been before me. Um, Bob, I got my tobacco hey. right here. Come in the mail today. And that uh, you see from uh, um, the uh, PowerPoint that we put together will be uh, as quick as possible here. We've done a research with the battle shoe. Once the, the idea was born about the moccasin identifier, the moccasin be our, uh, our way to uh, educate about our relationship to the land. And that uh, it's been an amazing journey of 10 years to get to where we are today. And I'm very optimistic that uh, our, our moccasin identifier will, you know, I think that I have the answer to all this visualization and it's the moccasin identifier. And to me, it's a tool as all the things that we've talked about to create the conversation. If we could put, we could have that all over the place and people ask, what is that? And if everybody knows to ask that, ask that question and the people will be able to tell them, you know, we're starting over. We've done thousands of kids and the uh, children in the school system. Uh, letting them know we have the as mentioned maybe Susan mentioned the curriculum and stuff that we've been putting out there and we hope to as I call it change the world our world and that um, here we have uh, the designs the Marcus and stencils that you see the four that we've used for the educational toolkit uh, all come from our real moccasins in the market in the Badish shoe museum um, the artwork we Philip Cote did the research on it he did the, uh, took pictures of those moccasins and drew them um, for, uh, for us to use. Uh, he did the uh, graphics and he created the moccasin stencils for us. So my, uh, if you've been in Toronto and you see all those murals, there you are. That's um, um, Philip Cote. Oh. Here, are, this is, this is like say the, the real, I mean, these are real moccasins. That's the Algonquin Anishinaabe uh, center seam into a stencil. And in the, the more basic one, uh, they call them bush moccasins in some of the articles I've read uh, that can be put on the ground. And those are somebody stenciled that um, on the sidewalk. Move on. We've been out there uh, promoting um, ourselves, uh, our program, uh, and all the different things that we get invited to be part of, um, becoming the, uh, the program. You could become a moccasin identifier education leader and teach treaties using the moccasin identifier educational kit, uh, the moccasin identifier experience opportunities. There are lots of things happening in this uh, today, uh, more than ever before, that you can go to events like uh, Indigenous Month, Indigenous June 21st, Indigenous Day, Orange Shirt Day in September, uh, Treaty Recognition Week in November, which is promoted by the province. Rock Your Mox, Sacred Pass Week with Cheney Wenjet uh, activities. And then the Moccasin Identifier inst installations uh, to install a, a Moccasin Identifier in your community, public space or work environment. Um, they can, you could, the Moccasin Identifier can participate in ribbon cutting ceremonies. And we're all about making it happen. 
and uh, putting our story. Here's some examples of the uh, of the different events we've been at. That's Fort York, uh, Dave O'Hara. You can definitely recognize that um, in the uh, in the educational day there, um, sitting with the kids and telling them about it. The Gibson House there, and uh, as part of June 21st day, and then um, an event. Uh, you can tell that that's what Kim Wheatley is, is there with us. That's at Fort York again. Some great, great uh, audience there to go with them. Those who want to come and paint. Uh, that's a school school classroom where the children uh, uh, took their turns and painted the marks and the identifier on paper, and they were able to take those back that were home with them. This is an amazing event that happened. we the First Nation was invited to go to the the Canadian National Exhibition and have a booth a huge space and that the marks and identifier table was part of that and you can see on the wall there uh, we invited people to to paint or stencil inside there and that uh, it just took off like crazy we that's over 800 stencils put on the wall within that's one week so and that's fun. The so that we, fun. That kept. yeah it's amazing it's just amazing um, so this is our, our signature site this was done with the province of Ontario. Uh, well, uh, uh, I say it was a very good uh, collaboration project with the, the ministry and the First Nation and, and design team and everybody that came up with it. So we give our input, they came to the community and the end result was uh, when they de developed the Toronto, it's called Trillium Park and the William G. Davis Trail. And the chief uh, was there to help open that up with uh, the then uh, mayor, or was it, she was the premier when. So this is another installation at Centennial College. Uh, you can't see all of this, the things there, but they have a plaque and they have in, in the sidewalk there, they've uh, embossed the Marcus and identifier on the, on the pavement. And further down, they have a sort of a half um, um, wigwam and people can sit there and there's a um, fire, um, not a fire circle with the medicine wheels in front of that. So great initiative where it uh, can be used. And, you know, when we talk about, our, uh, we're looking now to do installation, site installation across the Greenville, who has funded us the second time uh, to keep us going and getting paid. So you can see on the Mississauga uh, First Nations uh, treaty land map and the Greenbelt, they're almost, they cover each other. So um, we're moving along. Uh, with the, and the future will be, and include hopefully including Toronto Island, there'll be uh, um, magazine monuments, banners, embossment in the sidewalk. We, we brand, our brand has been defined. We relaunched our website. We've attended over hundreds of events, uh, done uh, community charrettes, hosted uh, presentations to thousands of kids, archaeological sites collected from the green belt, uh, and we're now coordinating markers and installation systems. Uh, we did the pilot uh, uh, evaluation of the educational kit with teachers, um, revised it with the input of the teachers working group, uh, partnerships with Indigenous Tourism Ontario, Eco Schools Canada, Public Works, uh, Toronto, Toronto Public Library, and many, many more Ooh. to come. Learn about the truth of the treaties, participate in Indigenous events, support markers and identify public installations, buy a kit, teach treaties in your place of work and your community through graffiti art, wow. changing, our, changing our world one moccasin at a time. There's our contact information. Moccasinidentifier.com. I do encourage you to uh, check that out. Miigwech, Carolyn. I have to tell you, and I'm sure Selena Young and uh, Jennifer Franks who are on the, on the call as well can agree with me that no matter what event we go to, and we ask, uh, we ask the community, what would you like to see in terms of placekeeping? The best answer, the, the biggest answer we get is they want to see the moccasin identifier. So congratulations. Oh, great, great. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, my good friend, KJ Jules McCusker. Uh, Jules is a philanthropist. He's an Indigenous philosopher. He's uh, a special advisor to a number of projects. He's a social activator and a senior creative director in a number of different uh, areas of work. But what I see when I see uh, KJ Jules is he is a visionary. He's an artist and he really truly expresses spirit in everything he does, including this work. He's gonna be talking to us a little bit about the Mishu Bishu Wetu uh, 
um, uh, installation that's going to take place at Snake Island. So to turn it over without any further ado, over to Jules McCusker, KJ Jules, over to you. Wow, um, that was um, that was pretty profound introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have to say that listening to everyone so far tonight, I, I just, I'm blown away, really. Um, I can't express how profoundly uh, overjoyed this feeling of coming together really is. Um, you know, it almost, it's actually gonna bring tears to my eyes. I mean, it's actually really powerful. Uh, I, I submitted this idea uh, of building a space on the island. Uh, initially, I was there for about, well, I, I'd have to back it up. So everyone's kind of shared a bit of a story of the importance of the island, okay? Um, just to give you a little background, I'm, I was raised in Alberta. I was raised in uh, the, you know, the little city of Calgary, uh, surrounded by Indians, um, you know, the Blackfoot, the Sutina and the Sarsi. Uh, lo and behold, I grew up there my whole life, not realizing that I was related to the Sarsi, the Sutina, I mean, sorry, not the Sarsi, the Sutina, as a Diné person, as a Diné uh, Cree and Inuit person from the Northwest Territories. So my people span like a massive amount of territory. And, um, and the crazy part is I have the three bloodlines, you know, um, you know, the, the Inuit bloodline, the Diné bloodline and the Cree bloodline which I have an ancient elder that said that we have a story that uh, a great angel came, a great spirit came and warned us that our people would be looking at destruction and unless we left the mesas. So we originated from the mesas and came up into the territories um, well over a thousand years ago, several thousand years ago. Um, and uh, if we participated in blood, with the nations east to west, we would forever be among the greatest nations in the world. And so the Diné and the, and the Inuit and the, and the Cree are among the three largest landmass tribes on the planet, including the Ojibwe. So um, it was weird to kind of grow up with the idea that my language was called Chippewan. So I was like, well, wait a minute, Chippewans are people, Chippewas are people, right? But no, my language is Chippewan. And I'm like, what? How? <laughs> that makes no sense. So I don't really know that, but coming to Toronto and living here, I arrived in 99. Um, it was 99 and I was hanging out in the city and my buddy brought up that there's an island. And I was like, there's an island? He goes, yeah, there's an island, man. You should go check out that island. And so I actually parked my tent on that island. And I just wanted to say that this is so important to me. It's just odd circumstance that I'm right across from the island. There it is right there. So um, the, you know, we're on the land that we're speaking of, we're in the space, you know, we're here. And uh, that was such a powerful experience. I was only there for about two months until the rains came. You know, coming from Alberta, I'm used to a thing called rainy season, but apparently, you know, every season there's going to be rain out here. So I got rained in one night and uh, my whole tent was flooded, absolutely flooded. Everything's freaking soaked. Everything's just like drenched. Um, my stay is ruined. So I'm like, you know, packing everything up and getting on the ferry and the locals there were like, oh yeah, you know who can't tough out, you know, you, you know who's not prepared when you see, you know, when you see what I was going through, right? I mean, it was like, I had, to leave, I, had to, I had to like, you know, emergency exit off the island and get to like a, a, a washer and a dryer, you know? Um, but that was my first experience and being there, you know, I bathed in the water. I, uh, I, I just was blown away. I was, it was magical. And when you talk about vortexes, like when I'm, um, you know, some of the conversations that have occurred so far, uh, these are real things. These, these are absolutely 100% real, uh, real things. And I've experienced them. And that's what gave me the vision. So, you know, fast forward, um, uh, just three years ago, I felt like I really needed some healing and really needed to like separate myself from the city and, and all the chaos. And I decided to park my tent on the island again. 
And I did that for a full season, almost two years, really. Uh, I didn't go through a full winter. I went through half a winter and that was pretty awesome. But I'd have to say that I'm probably the first person to never get kicked off the island for illegally camping there. Um, so there was something saving, you know, there was, there was a power, you know, and I recognized that say, Snake Island had a power. I recognized it from the moment I saw it. I used to see it from, because my first camp spot was on Algonquin, appropriate, right? My first camp spot was on Algonquin on the edge. And then my second spot was on Wards, Wards which is, you know, the original uh, island home. So Wards is named after a person, you know, uh, who had the first homestead house over there. Uh, I got to know the history. I got to know the people. I was appreciated by the people. And then a vision came that, um, you know, we need to occupy Snake Island, you know? And that was sort of how it came down. It was like, let's occupy Snake Island. Like, you know, it all came out to me. We need to make a camp. We need to make a thing. You know, it, it, was, it was all about occupy that space. And then, you know, I gestated on that for a while and I understood what the interpretation meant. It wasn't, it wasn't about occupying in a, in a um, you know, strength in numbers, uh, protest, uh, you know, indigenous identity, hoorah type of thing. It was, it was actually about um, something much deeper. It was about the fact that we deserve space to have our spiritual um, activities here. And um, I felt so blessed by the energy um, of your sacred land. So incredibly blessed by the energy of your sacred land. It's, it, it is so profound to me. And a couple of close friends, one of my very close friends, um, felt that my idea had some validity to it. And she said, well, why don't you present it? Um, why don't you put it forward? and just do it and I was like ah you know but I did and I was almost on a lark and it you know when I'm saying hearing everyone today and um you know Gary uh what you shared of why I named it what I named it and just the fact that you mentioned that it was appropriate you know that went that didn't go without much thought you know that went with some thought and I was going back and forth with a very close friend of mine and, and, you know, she mentioned like, well, isn't, is there any kind of like, what's the, what's the, uh, you know, Anishinaabe name for, for snake? And I said, well, there's something else, you know, there's actually something else that occupies these waters that's sacred. And that snake bit me when I was 24 years old, because I discovered, uh, you know, the, um, the, the lake leopard uh, when I was young. And I was so enthralled by this monster, you know, I was so enthralled by this creature uh, and the sacred reverence, especially to this creature, you know, because coming up from out West, we have creatures in the water as well, Ogopogo being among the most famous of them. Um, I felt uh, Mishupishu was, was absolutely 100% needed to be uh, brought out of the water and given reverence and space and, and then um, looking at indigenous design architecturally, specifically architecturally, um, I wanted to be very uh, accurate in the people's way of being. Um, I remember early on when I was young, one of my uh, dear elders from Sutina um, said to me, he goes, never be afraid about how, how other Indians do their thing. You know, some, some lodges will go to the west, some lodges will go to the east, but you don't need to go in there and try and tell them, hey, why is the lodge pointing east? You know, there's a reverence in what everyone is, everyone's doing. There's a specialness, there's a space. There's a space and a place, and there's a, and there's a meaning to it. Um, and that's why when I was looking at what the lodge really needed to be, I felt connected to what, what, the we too is and um i'm sure gary could speak to this quite well i mean uh there's quite a few people on this panel i mean shelly i mean i'm so glad to see you here i mean it's just really heartwarming um you know the uh the meaning of it is uh, uh really 
a type of traveling lodge. It's the type of thing that you, you build when you're hunting. You want to keep it low profile. You don't want to make a very extensive impact on the land. You want to be able to come in and come and go. But it's also large enough for a family. And, um, you know, it's a home, essentially. Um, and the sun's setting. So I had all this light here. And I think I might be here. I'll just switch the light. Um, the... Uh, you just got a couple more minutes there, Ed. Yeah, I just, um, but just to give you a sense, I wanted to go to the architecture. The architecture is one of the most important things about the place, um, the place and the setting and everything else. I wanted to make sure that we represented uh, three things. And that's when the three fires element um, came in. So I was very conscientious early on about um, the three fires council. I was very conscientious about the land and the respect of the land and the people. Um, you know, being from a space where I'm from, and I have uh, many people that come to my territory in the Northwest Territories and Northern Alberta that come there and are just magically and profoundly affected that changes their life. And that's exactly what this island did for me. Um, and that's why I feel that creating like space making for to honor the three fires because it's really the three fires that brought me there. It's the three fires that, that, that made me go seek that space to heal. It made me go seek that space and say, hey, we deserve an indigenous space on this island. We, we need to have ceremony here. And I felt that this would be a great venue. And you brought it up, Gary, the great venue for Shake Tent. And that was one of the first things that came to mind. And, and that's what these, these, these structures are about, is about being able to bring the people in and then when the conversations with the city about um, indigenous inclusion, you know, making sure that, that, that we have youth that get access to this space, that we have um, culture that can be enlivened by this space, that ceremony can take place and it be respected and it be honored and it be um, a part of the city's um, network. So there, there's, there's my closing um, element there. That's, that's in a nutshell. But the We Too itself is, is really about the incredible, uh, endurable, uh, genius architecture of the Anishinaabe people. Jimmy Glitch Jules, thank you so much for, uh, for presenting. So uh, we're gonna, we've got a few questions for you already, so uh, we'll, we'll come back for that. But I do want to, uh, to turn it over to the folks from uh, Council Fire, Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Center. Uh, the board designate, Andrea Chris John, is not able to join us this evening, but we are joined by uh, um, Andrea and Council Fire strategic planner, Theo Nazari. Uh, Theo is a PhD candidate at Ryerson University in uh, government and politics, uh, and he's been a planner, a researcher, and does a lot of amazing work. And I don't think the, the Spirit Garden uh, uh, work and that commemoration for uh, residential school survivors would be in the place it would be without Theo. With Theo is a uh, wonderful David Sherry. Uh, David has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Ottawa. He's a freelance uh, media designer and does a lot of uh, really great design work, advisory work, supporting Indigenous cultural organizations across the country. So I want to turn it over and uh, thank Theo Nazari and David Sherry. Over to you, uh, Theo and David. Thank you, Bob. Ani. Ani. How are you? I was debating whether I should wear uh, my, uh, my ribbon shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have. It looks good on you. Thank you. Um, so it wasn't false advertisement. Uh, Andrea was was going to join us. Uh, unfortunately, she has another um, commitment with our board. So uh, I've uh, agreed to step in uh, on behalf of our center. And uh, I'm joined by uh, David Sherry, my colleague. He's the project lead on the on the RSS Legacy Restoration of Identity Project uh, and the space that is ca being called the Spirit Garden. So first thing we'll do is we'll show uh, showcase our fly through. And uh, it's a it's a 3D uh, visual of the of what the space will look like once it's completed in 2023, and then I'll I'll present a little bit on what that process was like. If you don't mind, David. Way 
To our elders who teach us of our creation and our past, so we may preserve Mother Earth for ancestors yet to come, we are the land. This is dedicated to our relatives before us thousands of years ago and to the 150 million who were exterminated across the Western Hemisphere in the first 400 years time, starting in 1492. To those who have kept their homelands and to the nations extinct due to mass slaughter, slavery, deportation and disease unknown to them and to the ones who are subjected to the same treatment today. To the ones who survived the relocations and the ones who died along the way. To those who carried on traditions and lived strong among their people. To those who left their communities by force and by choice and through generations no longer know who they are. To those who search and are defined. To those that turn away the so-called non-accepted. To those that bring us together and to those living outside keeping touch, the voice for many. To those that make it back to live and fight the struggles of their people. To those that give up and those who do not care. To those who abuse themselves and others and those who revile them. To those who are physically, mentally, or spiritually incapable by accident or birth. To those who seek strength in our spirituality and ways of life and those who exploit it in our own. To those who fall for the lies and join the dividing lines that keep us fighting amongst each other. To the outsiders who step in, good or bad, and those of us who don't know better. To the leaders and prisoners of war, politics, crime, race, and religion, innocent or guilty. To the young, the old, the living, and the dead. To our brothers and sisters and all living things across Mother Earth and her beauty we destroyed and deny the honor that the Creator has given each individual, the truth that lies in our hearts, all my relations. <laughs> Yeah. Hey.
beautiful day. Hey, okay. Thank you, David. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the project. Sokoli uh, Seguego, uh, Theo Nazari Neon Gets. So I said in Anaida, my name is Theo Nazari and I hope that you're at peace within all creation. And that's what this project is, is about. It's about creation. It's about honoring our survivors. Um, at Council Fire, we're a cultural center. So in terms of indigenous placemaking, everything we do, the central component is the culture, the cultural component. So it's, a, it's our teachings, it's the language, it's the history, the relationships. Um, and we are guided by our mission. Our mission is about um, utilizing our cultural teachings, our languages, investing positively in our youth, um, enhancing the capacity of the Aboriginal seniors and elders, um, and uh, working with the people of the four colors, including myself, um, continuing to build on the natural healing relationships of Mother Earth, and to, uh, promoting the celebration of life, uh, including more. Um, the Spirit Garden is a, is a very, um, I would say, unique and special project. I would put it um, in a category of its own, um, it was, it was uh, started uh, through a process with the uh, Ministry of Indigenous, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation with the province of Ontario in 2016. At that point, uh, Council Fire was working on some projects before Indigenous placemaking was even a thing. We were working on, uh, on developing uh, a park to honor um, Dr. Lil Lillian McGregor, who uh, some of you may know. Um, from Whitefish River First Nation. So um, prior to that, uh, we had our, our um, regional TRC event. And out of that came uh, uh, an understanding that we need to, to develop a concept to honor our survivors. And it was decided there that the turtle uh, would be appropriate as it honors um, um, uh, Mother Earth um, and, and creation uh, overall in its entirety. Uh, so when the when the province approached us in 2016, we already had a vision in place, and it just uh, that relationship just formalized um, the process. And uh, the the Ontario government at the time provided 1.5 million dollars in seed funding, which allowed us to get this off the ground. Um, and then, and then um, the, in the TRC, it's, it's interesting because in the TRC. Uh, language. This is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission call to action 82. They talk about uh, uh, a commemor creating a commer commemorative piece that honors uh, survivors as a monument. And it's important to say that, you know, um, what I've learned, uh, monuments are not part of the Indigenous culture, they're not part of the Indigenous worldview. So we work to address that and mitigate that, uh, that uh, situation. And so we're developing a sculpture. Um, um, uh, we brought on board Ash Anishinaabe artist Solomon King um, right, right after uh, the, the seed funding was provided. And then we brought on board uh, an indigenous architect who many of you may know, uh, Brian Porter from Two Row Architects. And so part of our understanding from the beginning was to hire and to work with indigenous professionals um, and, and as part of our team and as part of, uh, as part of the project. Uh, when we were ready, we negotiated with the city of Toronto and identified uh, a, 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 an area on Nathan Phillips Square. Um, they tried to divert us. They, they advanced less visible areas across the space and we maintained our position. And as a result, instead of you know, having just this little area for a monument, we now have access to space that is 19,250 square feet in a very um, highly visible, publicly accessible area. And so it's important that we maintain our positions. Um, and then November last year, we procured the services of Gao Hastings. Um, they're a professional architect firm. Um, and, and, and then Turo Architect uh, worked alongside them as our indigenous consultant on the project. We are now finalizing the, the design phase, we're entering the tender process, we'll be hiring a general contractor at the end of this month. Um, and then from there, um, construction is scheduled to begin in September 2021. Ooh. And it's a two year construction project, uh, it should end by fall 2023. Um, so we learned uh, some incredible lessons through this uh, process, we've developed some amazing relationships and partnerships, especially with the city of Toronto, who have um, 
provided a substantial amount of funding to the project, um, as has the, uh, uh, the province. Um, uh, however, uh, we're hoping that the federal uh, government also provides the funding. Just in the recent um, um, budget, they, they outlined um, $108 million towards indigenous cultural spaces. So this project and others that we've heard about are specific to that. And so we're hoping that more funding comes through there. Um, and so, um, you know, I sit on some indigenous uh, placemaking panels and I think one of the last pieces I'll, I'll leave you guys with is um, a lot of the time, uh, you know, the city and other, and other governments like to engage uh, with, with uh, organizations like ours and um, it's all part of the engagement process. But I would say that we should not fit in a category of BIPOC or, or under this diversity or inclusion area. Uh, the relationship that indigenous nations have with the federal government is very different. It's very different from people of color and immigrants like myself. And so as a result, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we, going forward that, uh, you know, indigenous culture, uh, history, uh, languages, teachings are central in, in uh, that relationship with, uh, with the different levels of government. So our experience has been uh, really good. Um, for me personally, uh, somebody uh, who is new to this land, it's, it's been a privilege and an honor to work with Council Fire. I'm so proud to be affiliated with this center and uh, to work on this project. And, uh, and hopefully uh, in 2023, we will have this space. And uh, I look forward to celebrating with all of you as we honor the survivors um, and the communities. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, David. Yanko, thanks so much. It was a wonderful presentation. You're getting a lot of great uh, accolades uh, here from my, from my point of view. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to give our last presentation to Terence Radford. Terence is the principal of Trophic Design. He is based in uh, Coburg area, Northumberland County, and uh, he does a lot of great work. He is a, uh, um, a landscape architect. Uh, he does a lot of work in restorative design uh, process and the interconnectivity of all things related to our Indigenous worldview. He's Métis, uh, he's uh, certainly uh, very much in tune with the space, with the land, with the spirit of the island, the Toronto Islands. And he, as I said, is our Indigenous design lead on the Toronto Islands Master Plan. So without further uh, ado, uh, Terence, and I hate to rush you, I always seem to be rushing you, Terence, but uh, we are getting close to time. So over to Terence Radford of Trophic Design. No worries, Bob. I'm always at the end, so always a little rushed, but that's all right. Um, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. And let me just try and share my screen here. Hopefully I don't have terrible technical issues, which I've been having all day. So I'd like to just start off by uh, thanking the elders and the other presenters for taking the time this evening to share their knowledge and perspectives with us. Um, I'm incredibly humbled to have been invited and to be part of uh, this group and uh, to be part of the Toronto Islands team. Uh, there's just an amazing group of people that have been brought together and I'm humbled every day. Uh, so as Bob mentioned, uh, I'm a member of the Métis Nation, a practicing landscape architect in the province of Ontario and principal at Trophic Design, uh, a small landscape architecture practice in Coburg, Ontario. So I want to start by just simply stating that the following presentation expresses my own personal perspectives. They're based on my lived experience and practice as a landscape architect. Uh, these opinions I share are not meant to reflect those of either the Métis Nation, Indigenous communities, the City of Toronto, or DTAH. Uh, they are my own, and I share them in the hopes to continue a critical conversation on placemaking, placekeeping, and the representation of Indigenous peoples in the design and management of our shared landscapes. I would like to share a bit of background to allow you to all, all to know me a bit better. I was born in the small community of Fort Nelson, located in Northern British Columbia. My parents were both teenagers when I arrived into this world and we would move soon after my birth to Prince George to find employment and leave many of the problems that small rural and isolated communities feel. I was not raised with knowledge of my ancestry or cultural heritage as a direct result of the impacts of residential schools 
and my grandmother's experience um, at a day school in Fort Nelson. However, I grew up spending most of my time outdoors with access to the vast, vast natural beauty of British Columbia and gained a deep respect for the environment and landscape. In my early 20s, I would move to Victoria, BC to attend the University of Victoria. After starting a year in the creative writing program, I transferred into the Department of Visual Arts. As a young gay Indigenous male who was actively researching his own family ancestry in order to register with the Métis Nation and had become involved in our local Métis Association as a youth representative, I became obsessed with culture and identity politics and how we understand and inhabit a place. This obsession to learn more about myself and reconnect with my heritage and support my growing community would continue throughout my bachelor degree and into my master's in landscape architecture, where I would struggle with the underrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in our landscape, the policies and systems of governance that have led to the current state of the environment, and a general frustration with the absence of discussion about Indigenous culture, history, and rights in the educational system. Fast forward to the last four years, as a practicing landscape architect, I became involved in and have been actively researching Indigenous placemaking initiatives that were happening in cities such as Toronto and Vancouver. In particular, I recently completed the design and construction of a commemorative public artwork for the Alderville First Nation in the city of Kingston in Lake Ontario Park. I work closely with the city of Kingston and Alderville First Nation to develop the design for the project. I consider this project to be largely Indigenous placemaking activity. But now, as we look forward to its opening this summer, we are faced with a long-term prospect of what our responsibility is to this place that we've created and what placekeeping activities will we be required into the future. Over the past couple of years, I've also been working with Evergreen Brickworks as a design consultant uh, situated with the Limestone District School Board. As well, I've also been a visiting mentor for the Nickaby Dawadina Gigwag Youth Program, where we have engaged in active discussions on particip participatory design and co-design with Indigenous communities and placemaking initiatives. In the last two years, I've started to shift my focus to placekeeping largely as a result of placemaking activities and the implications of maintenance and management that have been created for communities. In the following few slides, I want to just share my understanding of these two terms and their relationship and why I believe it is important to focus on Indigenous placekeeping as we explore master planning for Toronto Islands. Placemaking can be defined as a collective process of improving public spaces by acknowledging the physical, social, and cultural identities of a community that define a place through local narratives, programs, and use patterns. In recent years, cities have made efforts to include Indigenous cultural narratives in the urban landscape as part of Indigenous placemaking initiatives. Essentially though, placemaking focuses on the products of design and the physical improvements to public spaces that we make. Alternatively, placekeeping can be defined as the act of care and maintenance of a place and its social fabric by the people who live and work or are visitors to that place. It is about recognizing the inherent rights of all our relations and considering our responsibilities to a place now and into the future. Placekeeping considers the past, present, and future to define a relationship of reciprocity to all living things and systems. Unlike placemaking, placekeeping focuses on the policies, regulations, systems, organizations, and practices that are responsible for the care of and formation of public spaces. While these two separate terms are used to discuss public realm initiatives, they are connected in a dynamic relationship where the ongoing process of placekeeping maintains and enhances the products of placemaking as a valued, sustainable, and high quality place within a particular local context. It is this dynamic relationship has, that has shifted my focus to placekeeping when discussing public realm projects. As when we focus only on the product or placemaking, this causes placekeeping to become a byproduct. This can result in unforeseen requirements for maintenance and become too onerous to maintain for a community or an organization. They can then result in long-term changes to a design or simple project failure to meet its objectives in a supporting community. Alternatively, when placemaking is only influenced by 
duration of placekeeping, such as selecting a more durable material to reduce maintenance or applying for a variance to allow a certain non-compliant design intervention. It fails to address larger systemic problems or shortfalls in community programming that may exist. As such, how we've started to conceive the development of the Toronto Island Master Plan has made placemaking directly embedded in the activity of placekeeping, whereby the products of placemaking happen as a result, a creation, a recreation, a renewal, a regeneration, a repair of place that recurs within an understanding and development of the longer processes of placekeeping. I like to think of this relationship as a chocolate chip cookie because I love food. The chocolate chips are the placemaking activities, while the cookie dough is what holds everything together. Too much of one and not enough of the other serves to make a bad cookie. So we have not yet identified the big ideas for Toronto Island, but we are envisioning that our recipe for the project will be a balance of equal parts programming, policy, regulations, and maintenance, from which a set of design ideas that may include but are not limited to planting, building improvements, physical spaces and rooms, pathways, artworks, will evolve. The shift to focus of placekeeping can mean a lighter touch to design solutions than those often seen in placemaking, but bigger chases, changes in the systems that actually serve to influence design and the use of places we inhabit and how we are allowed to inhabit them. We know from speaking with community that Toronto Island is a special place and it continues to be a place for Indigenous peoples. We hope that a light touch and a deeper exploration of how we manage and maintain this place for the next seven generations will help keep this place special for everyone to enjoy and highlight its significance as an Indigenous space. Thank you very much. And I'll pass it back over to you, Bob. Thank you very much, Terence. A uh, very lovely presentation and uh, happy to get to know you a little more. Uh, I've got a few questions here uh, from uh, the chat, uh, or from the, uh, the question box, but also a few questions uh, ahead of time. One of them is going to go to, um, uh, I'm going to go to Theo. Theo, you're going to get the first question. Again, asking to keep your answers very tight and very, uh, uh, because we are very short on time. So Theo, very simply, how can allies and others that are participating, we have 158 people on, uh, on the line, how can they support the Spirit Garden project? Theo, are you there? Maybe Theo dropped off. Oh, there he is. No? All right, so Theo must have dropped off. That's fine. So uh, I got a question for uh, Jules McCusker. Jules, very simply, again, very shortly, when will we see the uh, project at Snake Island and how long will your production take place? Oh, well, it's actually scheduled to go into um, construction, like pretty much right now. Like we're, we're in the stages of getting everything organized in the next few weeks. And then uh, we'll make decisions on when we're actually gonna, you know, put it there. But the goal was to be open uh, for June. So, you know, we're right on the corner. Very nice. That was the question, right? Was just really timing? Just timing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're right. yeah, I'm open to a couple more questions. Uh, maybe a question for Carolyn to help answer. So Carolyn, uh, I know uh, you've uh, spent a lot of time on the Toronto Islands. Uh, you know, one of the questions are, how can we be better at enjoying and sharing the island together, even with large numbers or crowds of people? Uh, you know, from an Indigenous perspective, how do we deal with uh, uh, larger crowds and trying to enjoy nature and parks in the Toronto Island in that environment? Well, I've been down there and done a few speeches. Uh, to, to some pretty big crowds. It's hard to uh, really tell the story when you, you know, you just got a little mic and um, you got close to a hundred people following you around. And uh, so I really think that we need to get our story on the, on the ground uh, through all these ideas are just amazing. And I'm so impressed. Uh, thank you to all of you. And that um, I think being present, you know, at the place being welcome as was mentioned before, that we want to feel like we're welcome to go there. 
it is a special place. We've done some tours there. We've taken the art community on bus trips in winter to do that picnic on the island like they did, you know, hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And that um, walked around the, the water's edge there, did the planted invocation. Doing things like that, I think they can draw the interest of the people from the city into um, different uh, uh, different venues, doing the plant, just enjoying the, the water and things like that. I think we have a place to be there in uh, telling our story. Uh, I'll, I'll say stories. So, yeah. yeah. That's Carolyn. Invite us, invite us in. <laughs> and uh, Terrence, you're going to get the final question. And the question is this, and I'm going to put you on the spot. We've been talking with focus groups, uh, you know, two spirit people, uh, indigenous women, indigenous youth, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit uh, Placekeeping uh, Group, the Indigenous Placekeeping Advisory Council, the Indigenous Sharing Meeting. We've spoken to a lot of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. What two or three ideas have bubbled to the top so far? And uh, what what is swimming around in your mind of what we might see in the master plan? In a, in a two minute uh, answer, Terrence. <laughs> in a two minute and not misstepping and saying anything that maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> um, what's bubbling to the surface so far? Uh, well, the importance of really thinking about this, I. Um, the idea of the land as being a being and having its own rights and responsibilities. And what are our responsibilities if we give the land that legal right and if we think of it in that way? Yeah. Um, and that's not just using it to death, um, but giving it respect and allowing it time to rest and recuperate. So thinking about things of how we maybe close areas um, from access to allow the land its own time, its own personal space. So we all don't like to be inundated all the time and have people constantly surrounding us. We need our own private time to recuperate. That and is incredibly insightful and beautiful in that, you know, that's not just Indigenous people are saying this, it is all people are saying the rights to the land, keeping it natural, you know, allowing the right to, of the, the land, the water, and the beings that are there to have the space too. So I appreciate that, Terrence. Um, you know, and uh, then thinking about the story that we might tell, or stories that we might tell about the island, and having that start right at the ferry terminal, um, and then how we continue that through the landing on the island and providing that sense of coming home when you step off the ferry and onto the island and how that guides you through as a wayfinding, potentially a wayfinding project that's not a traditional signage, but using uh, cultural moves and signifiers, uh, planting, uh, design of spaces to lead you through the island and tell a story, um, but also to guide you and let you know where you are. Um, so I thought it was, uh, yeah, I don't know how much more time I have, Bob. That's great, Terrence. Thank you so much, Jimmy Witch. That's great. Uh, yeah. In the Michif language. And thank you. And I want everyone to give a big round of applause wherever you are. Raise your voices to our beautiful panel with all these great placekeeping initiatives. So thank you very much, panelists. Miigwech, Carolyn. Miigwech, Jules. And uh, Marcy, Terrence. Thank you so much. Super oh. awesome. Beautiful. It's been a beautiful evening. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this. I want to thank the elders and knowledge keepers panel as well. It's been a wonderful evening. I know we're a little bit over time as well, but you know, that's the way the spirit moves. The spirit moves to the time according to our needs and, uh, and uh, how uh, things happen naturally, organically as we say. I'm going to turn it over uh, for a couple more speakers, one more uh, um, uh, thanks and offering closing remarks on behalf of Parks, Forestry and Recreation. I'm going to ask uh, Jeannie Romoff again to give us our, uh, our final uh, remarks. Over to you, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. I'm back. It's later, but I'm back. And I uh, have to say, I am um, listening and watching intently uh, a very very powerful evening and 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 uh, I just I always when I attend these as as a participant I always write down certain things that, that I try and keep in my mind and um, 
you know, a few of the things that I jotted down, you know, during tonight's session was uh, words tie, uh, tie you to the place. Um, how do we engage young people in a really meaningful way? Authentic conversations, follow through on commitments, the land as a being. And I must say what, what's really staying with me as well is the cho chocolate chip cookie of parks and, and uh, a very interesting analogy around how things come together in parks design. Uh, so I, I, I can't say a spectacular evening, uh, teaching moments, inspirational thoughts um, that really highlight the importance of placekeeping as well as uh, some great examples that have been shared of successful placekeeping initiatives. I, I consider myself to be on this learning journey uh, with, with many people. Uh, a sincere thanks. Uh, thank you and Chimaguich to, uh, to Chief Laform uh, for making time to be here this evening uh, as a symbol of our partnerships towards next steps on the Toronto Island Master Plan Project and considering placekeeping in our park network throughout the city, which is becoming uh, a very, very important part of our design and engagement process. Uh, a big, uh, sincere chimagoich to the elders and the knowledge keepers, Gary Sue, uh, Mitch Chase, Diane Longboat, Shelley Charles for spending time with us this evening and passing on your wisdom, uh, which I feel is just seeping into me. Uh, a huge, uh, ex uh, you know, thank you and a sincere chimagoich and thank you to the invited speakers, Carolyn King, who spoke about the fantastic Moccasin Identifier Fire Project, Jules McCusker, who shared about Mishu Pishu Wetu, Andrea Christian, who spoke about the Sprint Garden at City Hall, which is so beautiful, uh, and Terence Radford wrapping it all up with thoughts on the importance of Indigenous place keeping and design, uh, not just on Toronto Island, but in many other uh, parts of the city. It's an important uh, takeaway, all of this for me, is to embed the thinking that, 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 that everybody shared tonight into the work that we do uh, as we continue to explore opportunities for Indigenous place keeping across the city. And of course, thanks to Chima Gwesh, to our, to our guider tonight, Bob, for hosting and facilitating this event. It's clear that you have such a gift for doing this. And... Uh, and have earned the trust and respect of the participants and viewers. Thank you to Swerhun and the Master Plan Project team. A big call out to Lori, who has been, uh, Lori Ellis, who has been uh, really a, a big leader and, and to our, all of our uh, engagement teams uh, for supporting the work and pulling the event together. You've done a great job. And finally, I thank you to all of you who have chosen to share this evening with us. I know time is, is, a, is a precious commodity, uh, but there's been hundreds on tonight. Um, and your participation and your interest is a demonstration of the importance and significance of placekeeping uh, in our city. And we hope you'll continue uh, to, to stay involved to support this and many other initiatives um, we're working on. So thank you from me to all of you and, uh, and I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much, Janie. And uh, likewise, I'm going to thank uh, Lori Ellis, who is uh, our uh, senior project coordinator with PFNR, who's leading a great team. So we've got a great team behind us. I want to thank the folks at uh, DTAH, FS Strategies, and uh, and others who are a part of our consultant team. Uh, very much want to thank Ian uh, Malsowski of uh, Swearin, as well as Athavarn Shrikan Theraja who's uh, being behind the scenes and doing this work of setting this up, running the technology. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, Athavar, and thank you, team. Uh, the last word is gonna go to uh, my sister uh, of, um, of uh, the Chippewas of Georgina Island. She has, uh, and, and Sherry, uh, sorry, Shelly has uh, provided me with a link here for a new website uh, for Minokamik. And I'll spell that for you, M-I-N-O. K A M I K dot C A. So it's a brand new website. So uh, take a look at what Shelly's been doing. But uh, without further ado, to give us our closing invocation, I'm going to turn it over to Shelly Charles to uh, to say those words to the spirit. So over to you, my sister. Ge kinoe mana ke ka jin dayan bido ko shin minwa minwa kinoe ma shin na ke ka jin dayan 
when we started um, this evening, um, we started with those great words um, from our elder uh, Gary, and also that song. And um, I brought out the um, the friendship belt here, which I have. This was gifted to me. This is our um, Ojibwe uh, friendship belt. And as we were uh, sharing throughout the evening and talking about Oma uh, Akin Bemijawan and the water that flows um, throughout and throughout the earth, on the earth, this belt helped to remind me of how we started. We started with respect. We started this session with respect. We built some amazing friendships. We renewed friendships and we're left with this peace, which is um, really the power of these agreements, the power of these relationships. And then also um, just to acknowledge that what we're doing here as well is creating a, a brand new wampum with um, intergenerational uh, wampum belt. So Optigo, which is a great big Optigo, Gichi Miigwech Nika Anasadok. Miigwech, Miigwech Shelly, and thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you very soon. Keep an eye out for future events uh, regarding the Toronto Islands Master Plan Project. We're moving into the next phase, which is about those big ideas, the big moves. So we'll see everyone very soon. Miigwech, thank you. Good night.